part two of this set of slides is going to cover digestion and absorption of fats. This includes triglycerides, fatty acids, as well as sterols. Generally, when we talk about fat digestion, we're going to focus primarily on the small intestine. This is where the majority of fat is digested and absorbed in a, a normal adult human. However, there are situations where the mouth and stomach play a larger role, and these include uh, the digestion of fat in infants who have an underdeveloped and still developing and maturing small intestine. They're not able to extract at the same efficiency all the fat that's in their diet, especially given the fact that breast milk is approximately 50 to 60 percent of, uh, fat by weight. Therefore, lingual lipases, which are produced in the mouth, as well as the gastric lipases produced in the stomach, are very important as they begin the process of fat digestion and aid in the absorption of fat at a more efficient level. Also important uh, in the digestion of fats is the change in pH from when the food enters the mouth to when it hits the stomach, where you get a substantial drop in pH, and the, the churning motion of the stomach produces an acidic chyme, which aids in the emulsification of fats. Hepatobiliary and pancreatic secretions of bile acids, cholesterol, and lipases are needed to emulsify and digest the fats. We should note that triglycerides are not transported intact uh, into the enterocytes. They need to be broken down in the intestinal lumen by these lipases before they can be absorbed into the enterocyte. And finally, I just draw your attention to the fact that not all fats have to be absorbed in the small intestine via this route. Short and medium chain fatty acids can be absorbed directly into the blood. In the case of medium chain fatty acids, which are in high concentrations in oils such as coconut oil, can be absorbed directly into the bloodstream by the mesenteric circulation. Short-chain fatty acids in the diet can also be absorbed in the small intestine via this route. However, short-chain fatty acids can also be produced from the fermentation of carbohydrate in the colon, and again, these short-chain fatty acids can be absorbed by the colonocytes and enter circulation via that route. The process of digesting fat actually begins prior to food being consumed. The cephalic phase, and then followed by the gastric phase, once food has been consumed and enters the stomach, will directly stimulate the vagus nerve, causing the release of pancreatic secretions into the duodenum. Once the food in the stomach has been converted to an acidic chyme and it enters the duodenum, it triggers the release of secretin into the bloodstream, in turn causing the pancreas to secrete bicarbonate to raise the pH. The acidic chyme of the duodenum also triggers the release of cholecystokinin into the bloodstream, which reduces gastric emptying and causes the pancreas to secrete digestive enzymes. The release of cholecystokinin also triggers the contraction of the gallbladder. This introduces bile acids, cholesterol, and phospholipids from endogenous sources into the small intestine to aid in fat digestion and absorption. The emulsification of the digesta produces micelles, which continually decrease in size via the peristaltic motion and the shear forces within the GI tract. The micelles then interface with the enterocytes along the microvilli and are broken down by lipases and absorbed by transporters. For example, pancreatic lipase is a major lipase found in the gut during the digestion process. LFABP or liver fatty acid binding protein 1 uh, and an IFABP as well as CD36 are all fatty acid transporters involved in moving fatty acids from the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract into the enterocytes. Approximately 95 percent of the dietary lipid will be absorbed by the time the digester reaches the colon. Also, cholesterol and bile acids will be reabsorbed via specific transporters in the small intestine and this is generally completed by the time the digester reaches the terminal ileum. The presence of a large amount of lipid in an aqueous environment will produce a phase separation. Therefore, without emulsification, it will be next to impossible for the fat to interact properly with the digestive enzymes and transporters found on the apical surface of the enterocytes in the small intestine. The digestive enzymes, in this case lipases, would not be able to interact with the fat and break down the triglyceride in order to aid in the digestion and absorption. This is where the bile acids come in, as they're amphipatic in nature, and they have both lipophilic as well as hydrophilic properties. They help emulsify the fat into micelles, which continually get smaller by the shear forces and the peristaltic motion of the gut, 
allowing them to then interact with the intestinal villi uh, and the lipases which are found close to the surface. Um, once the lipid inside is interacting with these lipases, the fat is broken down and is available for absorption into the enterocytes. So cholesterol and bile acid balance is a delicate process and it involves the liver and small intestine to a large degree but the colon is also important in terms of um, understanding how cholesterol and bile acid balance is maintained. The average adult human will produce between 400 and 800 milliliters per day of hepatobiliary secretions. 85% of these secretions is water. However, the other 15% is made up of bile acids, phospholipid, and free cholesterol. Based on these numbers, this works out to approximately 4 to 5 grams of combined bile acid and cholesterol getting secreted from endogenous sources into the small intestine daily. Along with the dietary lipids, these bile acids and cholesterol are reabsorbed while the digester travels between the duodenum and the ileum. But this process is not 100% efficient. By the time the digester reaches the colon, where you have primarily water and electrolyte absorption occurring, and the average human will lose approximately half a gram of combined bile acid and cholesterol per day. This is excreted in stools and is unrecoverable. This irreversible loss of bile acid and cholesterol in stools produces a negative balance situation in humans and therefore the net loss needs to be replaced through both cholesterol synthesis as well as bile acid synthesis and this occurs via endogenous mechanisms. Now looking at triglyceride and fatty acid absorption, as I've already alluded to, the triglyceride is not absorbed as a whole molecule. It is in fact broken down in the intestinal lumen via pancreatic lipase to produce two free fatty acids and a monoacylglyceride. These are then absorbed via the various transporters on the enterocyte into the cell where they are then repackaged by several enzymes listed here and abbreviated. This is monoglyceride acyl transferase producing a diacylglyceride and then another free fatty acid are acted upon by diglyceride acyl transferase to produce a triglyceride. These reesterified triglycerides along with cholesterol esters are then packaged into a lipoprotein which is produced in the endocyte. This lipoprotein is called a colomicron. These colomicrons are very lipid rich particles which have a very low density and are then secreted through the basolateral membrane of the enterocyte into the lymphatic system where they eventually find their way into peripheral circulation depositing the triglyceride and cholesterol at various tissues before being removed from circulation by the liver. And this last slide now summarizes the entire process where you have fat being broken down in the intestinal lumen uh, into uh, monoacylglycerides as well as free fatty acids, sterols as well being absorbed into the intestinal enterocytes, packaged into colomicrons and secreted into circulation. Once in circulation, these colomicrons interact with other lipoproteins, in particular HDL, where they then acquire additional apolipoproteins. Apolipoprotein C is required for the activation of lipoprotein lipase, and they also require APOE, which is required for them to be recognized by receptors at the liver and removed from circulation. Once the colomicron has had its lipid removed by lipoprotein lipase and either taken up by muscle or adipose tissue, along with some of the other tissues in the body, which require triglyceride or sterol, the colomicron is then referred to as a remnant. As you can see, it's most of its triglyceride, which is designated as these yellow circles, has been removed. The colomicron remnants are then recognized by a particular receptor on the surface of hepatocytes. The remnant is then removed from circulation, broken down into its constituent parts, which take part in other cellular processes within the liver. That concludes these slides on digestion and absorption of fats. Uh, however, I'd like now to conclude with some linking concepts. Specifically, the chemical structure, the digestion, absorption, and reabsorption of fat in the small intestine will have direct and indirect effects on aspects of lipid metabolism such as lipoprotein concentrations, lipoprotein metabolism and clearance, satiety in individuals, endothelial function, cardiovascular disease risk, 
and have strong links to obesity and weight management. The following selected readings will give you a much broader overview of lipids and lipoproteins, covering everything from the classification to the digestion as well as metabolism of lipids and lipoproteins. I hope you found these short summary presentations of lipid classification, digestion, and absorption to be helpful in your understanding of dietary lipids and fats.